global warming today is something that jeopardizes the existence of human society and human life as we as we have known for the past thousands of years to discuss how scientists really look at the future direction of uh, global warming and how the forthcoming talks in Copenhagen in December are going to impact on whatever trajectory we are going to take. We are talking today with uh, D. Raghunandan who is with the De Delhi Science Forum and who has been following issues related to climate change and global warming for the past decade or more. So Raghu, uh, first a very obvious uh, question. How much of a danger is the planet in? There is a very serious danger. Uh, the fourth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said that, as you said in your intro, we have about 100 years. If we keep uh, emitting greenhouse gases the way we are doing today, if we continue at present rates, we are likely to see temperature increases on an average of above 5 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. And scientists are of the opinion that if average temperatures go up around 6 degrees Celsius, that's the end of it as far as human life uh, is concerned. And can we do something about it? Now, that's the million dollar question. Uh, the IPCC report also says that if we want to prevent this trajectory of rise of greenhouse gases uh, in the atmosphere, we need to take action immediately. We need to stabilize emissions of greenhouse gases within 2015. That's in a matter of five years. And after which total emissions globally should start coming down and should be approximately 50% of today's levels by the year 2050. That's the kind of targets that we are looking at and what the IPCC report also tells us is that we are very close to what is called the tipping point beyond which changes may become irreversible. And do you see the negotiations in Copenhagen really charting out a course uh, so that we can do the kind of things that we, you were talking about? That's another million dollar question. Mm -hmm. uh, till about a year ago, I would have said that there was nothing happening as far as the Copenhagen round uh, was concerned. Now I believe that some serious negotiations are underway. However, uh, I don't think they are going in the right direction and I don't think that the way things are going now, the Copenhagen uh, conference is going to produce the kinds of globally committed uh, and binding emissions cuts which are required. For instance, the uh, IPCC's report says that the developed countries, who today account for about half of total global emissions, should reduce their emissions by about 40% by 2020 and by about 90 to 95% by 2050. At the recent G8 summit, the advanced countries have together only talked about a long-term target at 2050 without any intermediate targets by 2020 or 2030. And scientists would tell us that uh, if we don't take intermediate targets, there's no way of reaching uh, the final goal. In the climate uh, debate, uh, there has always been this issue about the polluter pays and the fact that developed countries are responsible for sure. the major impact that we have uh, in terms of greenhouse gases. But uh, that also raises issues of uh, what are the responsibilities of uh, developing countries such as especially India and China, sure. very large and today increasingly also important emitters as far as uh, greenhouse gases are concerned. So how does one reconcile uh, both these? One that uh, there is a historical responsibility right. that exists but also the fact that today countries like India and China are also major polluters. Right. Uh, as you rightly said, these are two slightly separate aspects but very closely uh, related. The fact is that 
about 80 percent of the accumulated greenhouse gases in the atmosphere today have been put there by the developed countries over the last 200 and 250 years since the uh, uh, industrial uh, era. Now that is what are called legacy emissions. They are already there. All the negotiations now in Copenhagen are about emissions henceforth, the flow of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So even if we control the flow of greenhouse gases, its impact on the accumulated level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere will take time to uh, show. So we are dealing with two aspects. One is controlling the flow so that you prevent more new greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere and dealing with what you already have put in the atmosphere. Now, uh, the problem today is that while about 45% of the greenhouse gases flow is being contributed by the developing, by the developed uh, countries, it's estimated that by 2030 or so, developing countries would be contributing something like 75% of the new greenhouse gases uh, entering into the atmosphere every day. Now, its calculations would show that even if the developed countries undertake the deep emission cuts that they are required to do, if the developing countries go on emitting at these rates, you are not going to be able to halve greenhouse gas uh, emissions by 2050, that which is your target. That to the other issue that uh, how can developed countries help developing yeah. countries to bring down Right. their emissions. Right. So as I said, even if the developed countries control their flow, developing countries will keep contributing. But the reverse side of this is, even if the developing countries reduce their uh, rate of growth of emissions, the fact is that the stock of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, even with a reduced developing country contribution, would still be representing something like 50 to 60 percent contribution by the developed countries. So we are still going to be dealing with problems which have been caused by the developed countries over the last 250 years through what are called historical emissions. It's recognized that the developed countries must pay for the cleanup in two ways. One is by helping the developing countries to adapt to temperature rise and climate change which is going to happen because of what the developed countries have done. And the second is by the developed countries paying into a fund, uh, money that would enable developing countries to obtain and uh, absorb new technologies which will help to reduce uh, pollution. That's uh, uh, one stage of it. And secondly, to make available new technologies which developing countries may not have. Last uh, issue. One, uh, in the G8 summit in Italy, there was a joint statement by the G8 and some developing countries. And along with that, there has been this, uh, uh, there are reports that uh, the Indian position has changed. Uh, so what's really happening as far as uh, India is concerned in terms of looking at the climate debate? And is the Indian government really going in the right direction? Right. Uh, now, as we've been discussing, the developed countries have been very keen that the developing countries, major ones, particularly China and India, come on board. And in fact, they've been using this as an alibi for themselves not to come forward with the deep cuts that are required. Recognizing also the need for the large developing countries to make a contribution, I'm afraid at the G8 summit, which was joined by the G5 developing countries, China, India, Brazil and others have allowed themselves to be steamrolled into an agreement with the G8, where the G8 have made commitments much less than what they required to do, but the G5 have also said, we will also contribute. Thankfully, they have not so far mentioned any numbers, but they have said that they would contribute to meaningful deviations from baseline uh, emissions which till now has not been a developed country, uh, developing country uh, position. I think India in the uh, weeks to come will have to evolve a much better position in a way that would put the onus back on the developed countries and make any moves by developing countries 
conditional upon the developed countries undertaking deep binding emission cuts as well as compensatory fund and technology transfers to the developing countries.